How's it going everyone? Data here and welcome back to the Vancouver Canucks franchise mode here on NHL 24. Moving into episode number 24 for the beginning of year number 7, the 2029-2030 regular season. In the last one we had draft day drama for the 2029 offseason. After having won the Stanley Cup in year number 5, we missed the postseason in a bit of a retool year in year number 6. And now moving into year number 7, we're moving hopefully towards the end of our little retooling. And we had a big push in the right direction at the draft as we got Frederick Lundqvist at third overall. With the 10th overall selection, we traded up to number four and then traded up to number three in, like I said, draft day drama to select Lundqvist. Five-star shooting, sniper, 82 overall, immediately potential coming out of the SHL. 12 points in 52 games last season, but we're ready to put him into the NHL lineup this year. Another Swede to our lineup as well. He fits the coaching well at the moment, but we'll talk about that in a minute because you probably want to play a little musical chairs with the coaches. I'll get to that in a little bit. But Lundqvist joins the top six as another Swede. Lundqvist, Pedersen, Lecaire Mackey. we got the flying Swedes of the future. Hopefully Lundqvist being here on the top line would be the long-term goal. Ratu, Norris Tippett also making up the top six, of course. In the bottom six, we see Tom Goldman moving up to third line center. O'Brien probably sticking around as third line left wing. We'll get into that as well when we get into the comments. Fourth line, we brought in Jake Neighbors. We promoted Danila Klimovic. And we also promoted Miko Niskala, who was our second round pick in 2027. So a couple years later, now he'll be seeing some bottom six time. Yes, he's listed as a minor scoring forward, but we're gonna give him the preseason. We'll see what he can do. The defense, we saw a big shift in the offseason as we moved out Dougie Hamilton in the trade that got us up to the third overall pick. And we went ahead and acquired the rights for and then signed Evan Bouchard. 89 overall a defenseman who we signed to a four-year deal at 10.75 million per season. He's coming off of a 60 seven point season so we need someone who's going to be getting the offense jump started on the blue line because Quinn Hughes who's usually like a 70 point guy he has had back-to-back -back seasons of something around the mid 50s which is not typical for we him. Want him to find his groove again so whether Bouchard be playing with him on the top pair or Hughes can play with Heronic whatever it might be Hughes can hopefully have a little bit of support on the blue line and not have to do all the scoring himself on the third pair, we see Andrew Peak, who we signed in free agency to a two-year deal. And we also had a potential promotion, we'll see in the preseason again, to Maxime Bouillon, who we drafted in the first round in 2028. Yes, technically the Hurricanes drafted him, but it was really us. Long story, go back to the 2028 offseason if you want more on that. And there's the potential uh, defensive core for this next season. Goaltending, we see Hunter Jones, once again our starter. He has been a monster. Ever since we brought him in and we went on the Stanley Cup run, he has been our starter. Of course, don't forget what he did in the postseason in 2020 incredible one of the greatest if not the greatest postseason run in goaltending NHL history and then last season we, you know we were trying to lose games but he was the one just carrying us a little bit when we didn't want to be carried but he had a great year hopefully this season he can have a little bit of a break 74 appearances last season so our new backup this year is Ilya Leonov we signed him in free agency third round pick of the Blackhawks in 2025 yet to play in the NHL a couple of years in the AHL he was signed as an 80 overall now he's already up to an 82 so the the Ukrainian goaltender will be our backup. Healthy scratches at the moment. Akuratu, Atu's brother, will be 13th forward, and Jared McIsaac as 7th D. Down in the AHL, though, we have a lot of cleaning up to do, as we'll get to in the comments momentarily. Dallas Johnson, not really growing. Callum Ritchie hasn't been growing. Of course, he's been in the NHL. I just put him down in the AHL to show you that he's not in our lineup right now. Uh, Gustavo Kelly, got to hope for some growth from him. Uh, we're hoping for growth from Cody Brown, but we're going to need a little bit of a cleanup here in the AHL. Uh, same for guys like Brustovich, Kudryavtsev, guys who have just kind of stalled in their potential. And of course, we have Jansen and Muller as the two goaltenders, medium star, medium fringe and elite potentials, respectively. So here's how our lineup looks to potentially begin the 2029-30 preseason. We'll definitely have to play around for a little bit. Does Nitzel go back to the AHL? Do we give him a chance in NHL and, and power play, stuff like that? A few different potential uh, options to go with. But I gotta say, the majority of the comments in the last episode did not have to do with the, okay, great draft, or okay, where is this player gonna go? I think a lot of the comments, if not the majority, were talking about Markstrom, the RFA, here on September 13th, still unsigned by the Canadians. A lot of comments also mentioned about Lindholm, left-handed defenseman, low elite potential, 84 overall, 23 years of age. Mikhail Lindholm would also be interesting. He is an RFA over on Calgary. But we only have so much money and trade value to go around, and Markstrom is very interesting. Now, when I initially saw Markstrom, 
I treated him like I treat pretty much every RFA that the AI GM doesn't sign. Just move on, don't even think about it, don't cheese the game and go get an RFA on a cheap one year contract. It wouldn't make sense. And the Canadians especially wouldn't let their first overall pick from four years ago go for nothing. However, I'm gonna highlight a few points when we get to a few comments, because Markstrom might not be out of the question I, in my opinion, I think there's a way that it fits the storyline without doing crazy mental gymnastics to turn things around. I think there is a very, very realistic storyline that could fit. But that being said, let's first start off by diving into the comments from the assistant general managers. So we'll go ahead and start off with Gavin, who said, wow, big, bold moves this offseason to set us up for the future. Sad to see Hamilton go, but Lundqvist looks like he will be a superstar, and although expensive, I believe that trade will age well. Try him out on the first line and make sure he's on the power play as a finisher to maximize growth for a future Data Hall of Famer. There's definitely a need to move out some stagnating youngsters while they still have value. I would keep O'Brien, albeit on a short leash, our third line left wing, because he was a 20-goal scorer after all last season but Johnston and Richie should be moved for sure. Maybe to Carolina, we saw they had a lot of prospects, or another buyer for prospects, or maybe some picks in a high-quality draft class. That's true, next year's draft is a high-low class. We had had medium-medium the year before, it's high-low next year. Although it may seem tempting to spend a ton of assets on veteran players to fill holes in the lineup, we should still be focusing on growing our younger players and giving them lots of opportunity so we can come out of this mini-retool ready to start a true dynasty. I will admit, although it is harder to build a consistent contender in NHL 24 than it was in past games, it makes each year a lot more unpredictable and in turn more interesting and fun to manage. Great video data once again, and thanks for taking the time to listen to your community. Well, Gavin, thank you for taking the time to leave the comment for this community. Very well said. Thank you for leaving those thoughts. A lot of people were saying, you know, time to, you know, you know, get rid of these gun guys who have been stagnating, as I said at the beginning of this video, and I fully agree. But if there is one to maybe let's try one more year on, it's probably Caden O'Brien. Last year he scored 22 goals, and that was with, what was his ice time again in the end? 15.05, half of it kind of in the bottom six, half of it kind of in the top six. He saw some power play time, which he will again this season. If he can show improvement, another 20 plus goal, maybe 40 plus point season, I could see potential for O'Brien being a long-term middle six player on this team. If he's going to score just 17 goals, 12 assists, or whatever it might be, then I think next year's the time to cut Gaden O'Brien. Maybe even Tom Goldman eventually, but the leash is a lot longer for him as a 20-year-old. O'Brien now at 23. In the real world, it wouldn't be the end of the world to be three years older, but in EA land, to be an 82 at 23, that's a very different story. Callum Ritchie, meanwhile, an 81 at 24, didn't have a great time last year when we gave him the ice time, we tried to give him growth, just nothing that we've been trying to do has really worked for him. Give him a change of scenery, that's probably what makes the most sense. So, in this episode, and don't forget to Dallas Johnston, he was our first round pick, 24th overall, four years ago, still has yet to make the NHL, maybe we try and give him a little preseason time just for fun, but even the AHL, giving him top, top minutes in the AHL, well, top, you know, first line and first power play we've been giving him he's been a like under 20 goals just at 19 and under 50 points as well he's a sniper less than 20 goals for back-to-back -back years in the ahl not gonna cut it so dallas johnson also candidate to move out maybe we just give him a few games in the preseason just to say we tried but callum ritchie definitely on his way out o'brien longer leash but again, not very long. So moving on now to Eska's comment, who said, I think letting Dougie go was the move, especially given his age and how Lungfist turned out to be. I would make sure to find Lungfist his center playmaker of the future so that they can take over Pedersen on line one when the time comes. Marshall in Montreal seems to be our guy and the one that I'd go after. I say we don't mind using the next year to clean up our prospect pool and acquire draft picks or quality prospects. Our defense looks mighty solid. So I don't think we need to go after more each cider and spend prospects or draft picks on a guy whose plus minus has looked awful. Granted, it's been on Detroit, but I see what you're saying. Maurice Sider, he's on the trade block right now, so a lot of people are thinking about maybe we go after him. Keep in mind that it would take a lot of trade value, and if we want to use value on Markstrom, I don't know. So put a little pin in that. I feel very comfortable with our defense and it will probably sim relatively well. I get it that it might seem counterintuitive because Pedersen and Hughes are aging, but when we want to have a dynasty ready for their farewell. Well said, Eska. Yeah, that's 100% true. Now, and what's even more true is that there is no air currently in our system, I would say, even for Elias Pedersen. We were hoping maybe it was going to be Callum Ritchie, maybe it could be Tom Goldman. I don't know, Goldman. 
Edelman seems to, just in the way he simulates, small sample size, but he seems to be just more of a middle six guy. I don't think he would be a number one guy long term. Josh Norris won't be here longer than Pedersen. They're both 30 years old. So who could, and you know, and Atu Ratu ended up being a winger as well because of his faceoffs never grew and his percentage was always low when we tried him there. Sam Reinhardt was always a band aid fit as well. We've never had a true number two heir to the number one in our system. So if we could pick up Markstrom, he would definitely be that guy. So we'll get back to that again. Going over to Kieran's comment now, Kieran said, Hi Data, great episode, fair amount to take in. It was a lengthy one, just a few key things. Richie and those other AHL prospects look done to me. Perhaps in a month or two, you can send them in one-for-one -one swaps, or we can just kind of reset your picks from four years ago. Definitely a few possibilities, I hear you. Secondly, Lungfist is a fantastic pickup. He can be first line next year, hopefully with Elias and other, another strong winger as we start to push again. Finally, as much as I like Ryan Suter, who was our head coach to end last season, you could call it interim as we had fired, uh, was it Galena and Ronick? So Ryan Suter was like our interim head coach to end the season. Honestly, he is the second best choice right now because we went out and also picked up Kapusta and we saw that he has much better chemistry with these guys. So Kapusta is our guy and we need more growth out of the forwards than the defense. The defense don't have great chemistry, but the forwards are incredible with Kapusta as the head coach. So I'd rather score more and concede more this year than pad Jones' stats while our offense stagnates. Good point there as well. Thank you, Kieran. So with Kapusta as head coach, I believe it was a plus three, maybe even a plus five on the, on the top line. The defense goes from plus five, three, one one to I think like is it was it like zero two one something like that so it would hurt on the defense to not have Ryan Suter as our head coach but to have a zero plus one in the top six when we're trying to especially get growth that's the unfortunate part so Ryan Suter is I would think our future head coach he'll be in this on this team a long time he still signed on for six more years we love Ryan Suter but I think it does make more sense to have the A plus with the better fit as the head coach so I'll go ahead and just play a little musical chairs there. So Ryan Suter down to goalie coach, Kapusa up to head coach, and Suter up to associate coach. Staff chemistry drops a little bit, but it should be able to bounce back. Ronick is not very happy. Maybe an A rated as an assistant coach isn't great. And now that we've played around with musical chairs, we can also go out and sign an, AH, an NHL uh, goalie coach. Maybe I could just promote one of these guys though as well. This guy's very happy. Uh, maybe, yeah, B minus associate coach. I'm just gonna go ahead and make an ex executive decision right now actually. Ferriero, let's go and get him into the NHL uh, staff, right? NHL goalie coach. His chemistry is not high, his morale is not very high, but we'll see where that goes from there. If he's gonna have trouble, we can send him back down, but for now, Simpson can go up to associate. This guy, Lowe, can go up to assistant, and we'll see what happens from there. Kapusta as head coach, though, as I said, much better for the chemistry, as we're about to see right here. Yeah, plus three, two, two, one for the forwards, and that's without even moving things around. Maybe it could be even modified uh, further. And defense, that could be one, one, zero. Really not great. Doesn't like Hughes or Bouchard that much, but the X factor has helped to keep it a plus one. But I think it's worth the experiment for wanting to get growth out of the forwards. A few more comments to run through. I'll end off the YouTube comments by going over to Cheating Heel. As always, the wonderful knowledge from CH. Just going to skim through it. Cheating Heel was originally wishing that the timer would run out before we could swap the fourth for the third because there was a lot to give up. But in the end, uh, Cheating Heel is glad that we didn't do that. We didn't leave it to chance. Lungfist looks like a future rock star. Great draft all around. The amount of value we got is insane and a lot of them are gems. So kudos on a great job. Thank you very much. Cheating Heel goes on to talk about moving out some of those uh, stagnating prospects, what we could get, potentially prospects in Carolina or in Toronto. If we go after more each cider, it would probably be some sort of three-team deal where we trade Heronic for pieces, then take those pieces and trade them for cider. Because of course, if that's going to be right D2, then Heronic would have to be the guy who moves out. I don't know, would cider want to be second pair guy? Maybe he goes first and Bouchard plays second? I don't know, but just throwing it out there. Here's the heart of the comment though. Not sure I would touch Verhage as a 34 year old on his last year. We're thinking about Verhage. And if Josh Norris doesn't cut it, we need a mid 20 year old center to take his place. I would say go for Markstrom in Montreal to be Pedersen's replacement down the road in a Norris trade, but we'd have to eat money back to make it work as the Canadians are right against the cap. They already have Celebrini, Haggins, and even Suzuki already playing center. They don't need Markstrom. Maybe we get one of Haggins or Markstrom to be our second line center and then trade Norris elsewhere, kind of like how we just said for Hronik, trade Norris for value, get that value traded to the Canadians. And then the Canadians with their abundance of forwards would allow guys like Slavkovsky to grow, who's stuck on the third line right now as a 25 year old, 82 over all so take that how you will 
taking a center from them wouldn't hurt them, but their defense is so-so. So maybe they are in the team that we could ship Heronic to in a cider type of deal. Oh, the possibilities. Some further thoughts on that and then ending off with anyhow, it was quite an off season. Very pleased with what we got in the pipeline. Go Nux. Thank you very much, Cheating Heel. So just exploring what Cheating Heel just said right now about the Canadians. Typically, as I said, a team's top player is an unsigned RFA because they have some big contract in the way. We're not going to cheese the game and get some sort of one-year deal for two million when they would only have to clear up a few hundred thousand more. That's not what we're looking at here. But the Canadians do have Markstrom on their trade block, and they have quite the center depth on this team. Macklin Celebrini, James Haggins, two real-world prospects here, drafted third overall in 2025, second overall in 2024. So they had the first and the third picks, Haggins and Markstrom here in 2025. And on top of that, Captain Nick Suzuki, Kirby Doc, even Max Domi out here, not to mention the other forwards that are populating their system. So for them to say that they're open to moving Markstrom, I think that's realistic. I also think that there can be a great storyline crafted from this, because Stefan Markstrom, who was drafted first overall in 2025, he did not play when drafted after 2025. He stayed overseas in the SHL. So maybe there's an element of feeling disrespected by the Canadians for not having been played after being the first overall selection in 2025. On top of that, he's had three consecutive seasons of very similar stats, 22 goals, 50 some assists, 73, 76 points, and they're not willing to give him a long-term contract. So if we are to go out and acquire Markstrom, I would think it probably necessitates that we give him some sort of eight-year deal because him getting like one year, four million in Montreal, I think I might add to the disrespect that he's been feeling from this organization over the years. Did Hagen, this, this would very, this would probably seal it, but did Hagen's play in his first season? He went to Laval at least. Okay, so he got signed and played in Laval and he's been given his big contract, nine over nine million for six, seven years. He's been given his big deal for having given less results. Markstrom still waiting. So I think it makes sense that he's disgruntled and that we could definitely look at acquiring him, not only because they don't have the money, but because they would actually want to move him so that they can get value back and strengthen other positions as opposed to having so many centers and especially one who seems to be disgruntled and according to a storyline that would be very feasible to find. So thank you very much, Cheating Yield. We'll keep all those thoughts on Markstrom especially in mind. We'll now hop over to the Discord server to hear from AGM extraordinaire Hobbsy who said, Guess who's back? Hobbsy's back. Now that I'm caught up anyway. The trade up to three felt like a lot of value using Dougie Hamilton plus to move up just a singular spot, but boy, oh boy, Lungfist looks special. Big fan of that move and the draft all around. Lots of value and hopefully potential future impact. Well said. I'm good with moving some of the stagnating prospects and fringe guys like Richie, maybe O'Brien, etc. Get some mid-round picks or younger guys that have a better chance to grow. As Cheating Heel noted in the comments, a potential three-way deal with Heronic leaving and then Cider coming in is my preferred trade route to take. Unless we can keep Heronic for the third pair, unsure of how the value would work out there. An offer sheet to Markstrom or Lindholm is a solid idea in my opinion, with preference towards Markstrom as you can't win if you don't score. Another guy to target I'd say would be Brad Marchand, also on the trade block, I think he's 41 even. Yes, he's old, but he could provide some veteran leadership and maybe production on the fourth line. He may be more of a deadline acquisition though, exactly read my mind before I even said it, depending on how we are doing. I think that's it from me, go Nux. Pat was going crazy, loved the return of Hobbsy. So great thoughts there Hobbsy, thank you for them. I think Marchand is a great idea for a deadline type move, absolutely, especially once we can figure out what kind of player O'Brien might be if he's going to be a future, you know, third line middle six guy. But aside from that, another comment saying, let's maybe look at Markstrom. For the defense, I hear you on side. I definitely see how Heronic out and Cider in would be helpful overall wise, defensive attributes wise, and all that. But Heronic has been very good in his time with us. He's probably on some sort of no trade clause as well, signed on for four more years, including this one. He's been a great piece of our franchise. So in the real world, of course, I would love more. Cider, but in EA land, they don't seem to be super different in terms of their production, in terms of their defensive impact. So on top of the fact that we want to keep our trade value, let's say, imagine we're trading a second, a first, whatever it is, in the Markstrom deal, I would say let's wait on that again towards the deadline, even towards next season. Let's give this defensive core a chance now that we've brought in Evan Bouchard and see where it goes from there. So that being said, ladies and gentlemen, I did ask the on-call AGMs in the Discord server, for, according to a little poll here, I said, hypothetically, if we were to go after Markstrom from the Canadians, should we, number one, offer sheet him for one year, which would cost a first and a third, or we go a little lower, below five million, we see if he takes it and it could be just a second round pick. Do we, number two, 
offer sheet him for seven years and it costs us multiple first round picks? Or do we, number three, trade for him and then extend him with the cost approximately being a first, a second, and Cal Ritchie? So, you know, we could sign him for like a one year deal and it's only costing us a second round pick or we can trade for him, pay a little bit more and we get to lock in an, a good AAV for eight years. Now, if he wanted eight years, 13 million or whatever, we'd say, okay, we'd have to, let's do a one year, let's get him down to RFA eligibility, then we'll give him a realistic contract. But right now for seven years, he wants 9.7. So I wouldn't be surprised if we could go eight by nine point something on Markstrom, which I think would make a lot of sense for a player coming off of an ELC who's 20 Two, who would then be an expiring UFA when he t turns 30. I think an eight by nine type of thing would make a lot of sense for Stefan Markstrom. He's not getting his long-term money in Montreal, so why would he sign just a one-year deal to come to Vancouver? I see the argument for it. So if we want to give him that eight-year deal and not seven years where we have to pay multiple firsts, let's give, let's say, a first and a second and trade for his rights. Essentially telling the Canadians, look, we can sign. We don't. You don't have the money. He doesn't want to stay with you. We know that we can sign him for a first and a third or even just a second, but we're willing to give you a first and a second to get his rights. So you'll be happy. We'll be happy. I think it makes everybody happy and you can just wash your hands of this situation not have to have it looming over your heads or anymore Montreal media going crazy the first overall pick not being signed what's going on so if we take Markstrom from you Montreal I know this is this feels a crazy way to start the episode but this is what we're thinking about instead of having to give you a first and a third in the same year I could try and stagnate it I could give you a first in 2030 or even a first in 2031 because it seems to be a strong draft class this year whether or not we have a high pick it's a high draft class this year so if I give you a first in 2031 and let's say a third right now let's start with a first and a third before we go crazy and i'll throw in cal ritchie to give you a depth forward. they have a lot of forwards they need to get out of their bottom six and into their top six so if i give you just a pure bottom six guy that will allow you to have the bottom six guys previously move up to your top six guys now with marstrom moving out of the lineup so i'll give you cal ritchie i don't know why i didn't click it there my apologies i'll give you cal ritchie with a first and a third and you get to move out markstrom now aside from that they want big money if i look at players they actually want only at the guys they want it's guys who are costing a lot of money or our top prospect they don't have any money so i'm not going to break my head to make some sort of crazy deal retention three team four team i'm not going to break my head for that they are interested in, in o'brien which is something to note but again if I add the 1.5 million, they're over the salary cap. So even then. So if I offer you Montreal, a first, a third in Cal Ritchie for Markstrom, I know it's going to cause more issues in our top six. And that's the whole reason I didn't want to sign any free agents in, uh, in July who would be in our top six, kind of overcrowding it. But when you have an opportunity like this come around, it's pretty much an acquire and figure out later type of deal. If we need Norris to play third line plus first power play, so be it. I don't know what we got to do to make it work. This opportunity is too good in the short and the long term. Another Sweden here with Pedersen, with LeCaramaki, with Lundqvist, then with Markstrom. We have a lot of Swedes in that top six. I think this could be very good for both us and the Canadians and especially for Markstrom. Montreal, Mr. Kent Hughes, what do you say to this? You aren't where you need to be in value offered. Yeah, that's what I thought. When I look at the value... I would think it would probably be a second round pick. So if I give you a second this year and a first next year, a first, a second, and Cal Ritchie, can I take back a pick in this year's draft since it's a good class? Can I take back a sixth from you, Montreal? What can I say to this? What do you say, Kent? All right, I am happy to accept this, uh, this proposal on behalf of the Montreal Canadiens, and we consider it a done deal wow blockbuster bombshell to to start off year number seven here in vancouver ladies and gentlemen stefan markstrom the first overall pick of the 2025 draft welcome to vancouver oh my goodness what a deal so cal ritchie we got you in the thatcher demco trade with colorado what like three years ago now four years ago sorry it didn't work out we gave you your chance all the best in montreal hopefully you can succeed over there and although it hurts to give up a first and a second, I don't think either of those picks would ever become the level that Markstrom would be, unless you'd have to really uh, strike gold on that. So we're gonna go best AHL lines for the moment, and now what we wanna do, of course, is let's explore what an extension to Markstrom would look like. Welcome to all your, you know, join your fellow Swedes here in Vancouver. You're not joining the Coyotes, no offense to the Coyotes, but you're not joining a random team. You're joining a team that just won a cup two years ago and has a lot of your fellow countrymen on it, and we're willing to pay you in the long term. So if we go to our RFAs, Markstrom, what do you want for eight years? One by five, we saw five by, okay, six by yes, seven by, okay. 8 by 12. Okay, so it does change a little bit. 8 by 12. Oh, because you know what? Now we're the team dealing with it. That's why the, the system has changed. 
If you're the team dealing with a prospect who hasn't been signed, he only wants a one-year deal. In free agency, who's open to six, yeah, six years. But if you're the team themselves, because now according to Markstrom's AI brain, we're the ones who didn't sign him over the offseason. So now he only wants a one-year deal. So that's why it's kind of deal, doing like that. So if we did want to stick with the eight-year extension, that would mean we're paying about $10.45 million for eight years. Again, I still don't think that's crazy for a 90 overall who's going to be wanting way more in EA land as the years go on. We could go seven years. I don't think that's crazy either. That does bring it down by a million, which is great. We could even, like, ideally we would probably do like three or probably three years keeping as an RFA. But I think the storyline has to be that he left Montreal because he wants his long-term deal. Now the question is, do we do seven years or eight years? If he is the player that we hope him to be, in seven years, he'll be wanting a boatload of money. Way more than the 10 point whatever we'd be giving him. So I think it would be worth it, even though it costs a million more right now. Basically the difference between signing him for seven years at 9.75 or for eight years at 10 and a half. So for an extra 750k per season, I'll get that extra year so that he's happier. Plus, we can push having to give him a crazy huge contract by a season as well. Because by time 2037 or whatever rolls around, he'll be wanting a good uh, 13 plus million. So 10.45, let's round it up to 10.5 million. Eight years at 10.5 million, that is quite a bit of money. $84 million, if my math is correct. We're definitely taking a gamble on him right here, but he's been consistent. Three consecutive years of putting up 70 plus points. He's the playmaker that we need in the middle six. He could be Lundqvist's future guy. He's another Swede joining the fold. It's a bit more than I wanted to do. I was hoping for eight by 10, eight by 9.75. But I think 8 by 105 is a deal in which that he'd be very happy to say, this is why I came to Vancouver and why I am happy to come to Vancouver and sign here. So 8 years at 10.5. Let's see what he says to that. Currently considering his options, he'll get back to us later. All right, Stefan Markstrom. All right, I hear you. Our extension dollars right now, next year we have... To, so that would pretty much bring our extension dollars down to 10 million for next season. And we only need to sign Norris, O'Brien. But okay, we, yeah, we, could, we, can, we can survive with that if we ended up ever, even having to sign uh, Josh Norris. So we'll see what Markstrom says and then we'll figure out the lineup from there. But huge, huge way to start the episode. The vote, as you would have seen earlier on the screen right now, was in favor of going for the trade. I don't know what the votes are as of time of editing, but as of time of recording, it was eight votes for the offer sheet for one year and 13 votes for the trade and extend long-term option. Hobbsy had listed some reasons for why it would be better to go for the number three option, because even though the AI isn't really smart enough, there is the possibility that a match would have been possible if we did a one-year thing and then there goes everything on top of the fact of the being disgruntled with Montreal and the storyline that we created. So I think it made sense the most to say, let's trade for him and then let's extend him as long as possible. So, whew, my goodness, what a way to start, ladies and gentlemen. I sent out the scouts, so I think we're good to advance. So what I'm just going to do now is quickly send out a couple offers to some AHL players because we're missing some spots down in Abbotsford. And then we'll start advancing towards the preseason and see what Markstrom has to say. Okay, advancing a few days now, waiting for the big decision from Markstrom. I want to know where he fits in the lineup as well. That's going to be big. Of course, the Canadians would have wanted to get more for him, former first overall selection. But with the understanding that they could have lost him for a first and a third, I think they'd be very happy to get a first, a second, and even a bottom six forward. So, yeah, I'll take that into consideration as well. And the disgruntlement and everything else that we're going with. So, advancing a few days now, Stefan, what do you say to an eight-year deal in Vancouver with your fellow countrymen, Jacques Perrault signing on for the AHL, same with Brendan Othman and Roni Hervenin. Is it Roni? Roni? I think it's Roni. Waiting another day here. Come on, Marshall, your fellow countrymen are waiting for the party in Sweden. Let's not go yet. I saw the Canucks logo, so I thought that was going to be uh, the exception. I've decided to reject your contract offer. The salary needs to be a little bit higher. If you're asking me to compromise, ah, okay. So because he only wants the one year, we can't quite go 85% as much because we are asking him to compromise on him changing from a one-year deal to an eight-year deal. Of course, the AI doesn't understand the actual storyline. That would make the most sense. But let's go back to the drawing board here. If I give you eight years... I prefer not to go crazy, crazy high. Worst case, I will go down to seven, but I'd like to get that extra year at eight. So I'm gonna say probably eight years, 11 million is my final offer. I know it sounds like a lot, but do keep in mind that the salary cap is currently 100 million, so that's very different from today's NHL. Eight years, 88 million, four extra million, going up by 500K. If you don't want it, I'm gonna go probably seven years at 10 point something. But let's start eight years, 11 million. If you like that, that's great. I understand the salary cap's 100 million, inflation, the economy, housing prices. I understand, especially we're in Vancouver, right? So let's advance a couple more days. Can we get you signed on before the preseason? Let's go, Stefan. What do you say? Think it over. Given a few days. What do you say now? Last chance. Still rejected. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and we'll start the preseason without him, unfortunately. But I will go ahead and change the offer. 
I'm gonna say let's try seven years at 10.25 instead. So instead of eight years at 10.5, we're going, we're going down to seven years at 10.25. So it's a million less than he was asking for, but before, when it was eight years, we were giving him like 1.2 less than he was asking for. So from his um, from his seven year demand, it's 1 million less than he was asking for. So that being said, we're getting ready to begin the preseason now. I think we'll keep the lineup as it's been, as we've been saying it will look. Maybe we'll try Lungfus on the top line, move things around. Maybe try moving Niskala up to the third line. Let's try that. Yeah, let's try Niskala on the third line for the preseason with Goldman and O'Brien. We already know who Pit Colson is, and we love him for who he is, so that's fine. Like Aramaki playing top line with a plus three. That's going to be big, hopefully, for his growth. I'm going to go ahead and fix up the special teams, power play, and all that, and we'll get simulating into the preseason. And of course, before we continue, like we said, we wanted to look at dumping some of those excess prospects. We have a few defensemen we want to move out because we have defensemen who are healthy scratch down the AHL with like low elite, low top 4D potential. On top of Johnston, who we had mentioned earlier, we want to move him out. So in a perfect world, I think we take back a defenseman. I wouldn't mind taking a winger, but a 70 overall 20-year-old defenseman, on top of the fact that we're not going to get a top first round pick, a formerly drafted prospect, who's 19 or 20 for just some scraps here. Here's a guy who's 20, he's 70 overall. Doesn't seem to be growing like at an exponential rate, but he's a decent enough prospect. He's on their block. Carolina, what do you say to this with a sixth round pick included? No, let's just try straight up for Klo. Still doesn't meet the block particularly well. Understandable. Can I throw in uh, Pedal? Does that do anything for you if I throw Pedal into the deal? What do you say now? Still reject it. You're quite far off in value. Eh, that's fair enough. So honestly, if we made a deal for a prospect, we'd be taking back someone who was not even worth our time anyways. We'll end up trading that player a couple, in a couple of years anyways, as we're doing with these players right now. So I'm just going to try to look for a pick, I think. Close probably, I looked at a few teams with prospects. This is probably the one that made the most sense without taking like a guy who was drafted in the first round. And even then, it probably wouldn't go through, but just to say. So I think we'll just look into getting a pick. Essentially just looking for a team that's listed as a seller, meaning that they would want younger players and they want to trade late picks. So Edmonton, what would you say to a fourth and a seventh for these four names? Maybe even a bit more, maybe a fourth and a sixth. What do you say to that? Ah, they don't have it. A fourth and a fifth then. Fourth and a fifth for these four prospects. All right, trade accepted. Thank you very much. Maybe it could have been a fourth and a fourth. I'm happy with a fourth and a fifth. Thank you, Edmonton. A fourth and a fifth. For those prospects some have been here a long time so all the best in edmonton i hate to trade in within the conference but the problem was there weren't a lot of teams that didn't have their contract spot that would have had four contract spots open so edmonton takes them on we get a fourth and a fifth in this next draft which is great it's going to be a high low class we'll just go ahead and fix the roster and we can get into the simulation Okay, so good luck in Edmonton, guys. Thanks for everything. Thanks for the memories. Hunter Brusevich, I'm excited to see what he'll do in the real world, but okay. So game one of the preseason now. Let's simulate this one. Wow, big 7-4 win. Oh my goodness, against uh, Brock Besser and the Seattle Kraken. Wow, two goals and an assist. Look at that. There's Caden O'Brien trying to make his case. O'Brien with three points and a plus four. Ratu with a couple points. Bouillon with two assists. We're giving him power play unit number two. I'll show you the lines and the special teams once we figure out Markstrom. But wow, great plus minuses. Awesome. Hunter Jones, four goals and 38 shots. Yeah, we can live with that. Great night. Caden O'Brien, first star honors. And our good old friend, Brock Besser as the uh, second star honors. He was back in the Tyler Bertuzzi trade a few years ago. So 7-4 wins, advance another few days here, waiting on Markstrom. Let's see if he's gonna be ready for the next game of the preseason. Giving him the seven year offer instead. Nope, not ready yet. We'll keep the lines as they were. And it's a 4-1 winning as Anaheim. Very nice. Two goals and an assist from Jonathan LeCaramaki. Two assists from Ratu. Very nice. Lungfus with an assist. Great. And uh, Jones oh, just allowing one goal and 32 shots. With the three stars being uh, Karamaki first star. There you go. Very good. So we'll get Leonov in for the next game. And hopefully Markstrom's in now. Come on. Let's go, buddy. One more day. We're waiting on you. You shouldn't be like, taking this long. Uh, okay. Stefan Markstrom, welcome to Vancouver. I've decided to accept your offer. I look forward to making an impact on this team. Wow, big splash here, ladies and gentlemen. Seven years, not eight, unfortunately, but we do end up saving money on it. And, you know, it was probably better that way with him not wanting to take 11, 8 by 11. I wouldn't want to go 11.512. So I'm okay with the seven years. Still a long term deal. That's what he was looking for, and that's what he's finally gotten. So now let's go ahead and fix up the lines. Josh Norris is probably getting bumped off of second line center, unfortunately. Uh, no points in two games just yet, but then Tom Goldman's down here. We want him to play center. He probably goes wing. Then there's no room for Niskala, maybe. So it does create some problems, but hopefully the preseason will help to alleviate those issues. Let's get him in the lineup and then see what happens in the preseason. Oof, all right, so here's what the lineup would potentially look with Markstrom in the lineup. It is unfortunate to see Goldman down on the fourth line, 
So that's where we might have to make some tough decisions. Even Niskola, I don't know if he can stay here. If Petkolsen's coming there, I think he goes fourth line. Then there's nowhere for Klimovic or for Ratu. I don't know, a few things to consider. But Marksman right now as second line center would be playing with Lundqvist and Tippett getting a plus two. He doesn't have a great fit in the top six. I, not a bad fit, but I would say it's a great fit. He has a perfect fit on the third line, which is good to know. But really, he'd be a top six guy for us. And his first line fit isn't ideal. So note that as of now, with the flying Swedes on the top line, Lundqvist, Markstrom, Lekarimaki. It would only be a plus one with Kapusta as head coach. So keep that in mind. X-Factors could still change things, etc. For the power play, I'm going to try the units looking like this. Unit number one, and then unit number two, plus five, plus two. Definitely a weaker second unit, but yeah, I'm going to see if Lundqvist can be the finisher here on the second unit, as opposed to having to be the guy on the first one just yet. For the penalty kill, I'm going to try unit one, unit two... And unit three will try looking like that. It's not enough ice time for Goldman, though, which is what concerns me the most. Fourth line plus third penalty kill, not enough ice time. So we're going to see what we can get done here in the preseason. Leonov will start this next game, and Markstrom kind of making his Canucks debut here in the preseason. He flew in, just signed the contract, and he's ready to rock and roll. This one ends 4-3 for the Oilers. They have a big comeback in the third period. We're up 3-1. We lose 4-3. Unfortunate. Three points from LeCaramaki, three points from Pedersen. Uh, negative twos from Neighbors, Bouillon, and Peak. Negative one from Markstrom. First game with the Canucks outside of Montreal here. 18.33 of ice time with one shot on net. Alrighty. Next game of the preseason here against the Kings. LeCaramaki currently with eight points in three games. Let's see if that continues. Canucks win 2-1 in this one. Shots 45-24. My goodness, just got away with it here. Pedersen with a goal. Hughes, LeCaramaki, Tippett, O'Brien, Lundqvist with points here. Six shots from Lundqvist. I love to see that. Seven from Pedersen. Very good. And no negatives for the plus minus. For Hunter Jones, 23 saves and 24 shots. But this next game against Calgary, we'll go back to Leonov. Hunter Jones is looking good. We know who he is. Leonov's the one who hasn't played in the NHL before, so he's gonna get he's gonna need to get some reps, maybe all of the games for the rest of the preseason. There's only three games left. So here we go against the Calgary Flames. Unfortunate 4-3 loss, but another great game from LeCaramaki as he scored two goals. Looking great out there. Hronik negative two. All right. Markstrom even plus minus. Yeah, and assist. There you go. So it'd be good to see something from Markstrom. Six goals and 11 points in five games from LeCaramaki here in the preseason. Great signs, hopefully, of things to come. Leonov in again for this one against the Sharks. Two games left in the preseason. Big 5 nothing win, and oh my goodness, we outshot the Sharks 53-20. to Close to triple through a, few, a full 60 minutes. Owen Tippett scored twice. Great to see. Markstrom, two assists and a plus two. All right, getting into his groove now. Let's go now, Stefan. Josh Norris has not been impressing me here. No points through the through those six games in the preseason. Let's just give a game to Tom Goldman and see what happens. Niskala, I think at this point we're sending him down. we got to give him ice time. He's not going to get it here this season. Let's try a game of O'Brien, Goldman, Pudkolzin, which was the original third line we thought we'd be going with. Let's give the final game of the preseason to that third line and see how they do. Leonov will start again after shutting out the Sharks. Last game of the preseason here will be against the Vegas Golden Knights. They'll make some decisions. First period, 2-1. Very nice. Pedersen, Lakaramaki. Second period, 4-1. Lunkvis and Markstrom. And the final score is 5-4. Data 7 8 Hall of Famer, Mackenzie Blackwood between the pipes there. We allow three in the third we hang on for the 5-4 victory. Let's see that third line especially. Four points from Pedersen. Markstrom, two points. But I want to see that third line. Put Colson, no points, negative two. Niskala, nothing on the fourth line. Uh, O'Brien, no points, negative two. Goldman, no points, negative two. So, does not help their case, I will say. Uh, Pedersen, first star. LeCaramaki, second, uh, third star. So, great stuff from that top line. Just a quick glance after seven games. Seven goals and 13 points from LeCaramaki. Let's really hope he can uh, replicate at least some of that in the pre in the regular season. Same for Pedersen. Also scored 13. Ratu, eight. Lungfus had six in seven. Very good. Bouchard, Markstrom. Uh, well, Markstrom, a point per game. Five and five. Bouchard and Hughes, five and seven. Tippett, O'Brien, Neighbors with four. And the real disappointment was Josh Norris, the only forward who played all seven games and didn't have any points. Negative one, nine penalty minutes, averaging 14.40 per night. He's playing third line and second power play, plus some penalty kill. But that's not what we wanted to see from Josh Norris. I think we can still give him till the deadline. He has a modified no trade clause, but not looking good for Josh Norris, especially with Markstrom coming in. I feel bad. I want to give him second line, but Markstrom was too good to pass up. Leonov, 2-2 two two with a shutout. Uh, Jones, 3-0 with a 9.37 save percentage. So obviously, Hunter Jones, our starter. But good to see Leonov getting some reps and doing okay. I will say he had some third period struggles, but that's that. So Niskala, I think we'll give him another year in the AHL. I thought for sure we'd call him up. It was more just my thinking as opposed to logic according to the overall. 
According to his overall, according to his role, he's not ready yet. According to the timeline, I was hoping he'd be ready, but I guess it's just not time yet. So he'll go back down to the AHL. He'll play top line. Let me just make sure the lines are fully, fully ready for both the NHL and the AHL, and we can finally get simulating. Whew. All right, finally all done. Up until this point could be an episode in and of itself, but all right, let's simulate up to the first game of the regular season. Year number seven kicking off here against the Anaheim Ducks at the Honda Center in Anaheim, starting on the road after, like I said at the beginning of the episode, Stanley Cup champions a couple of years ago. Last year, quick little reset, got a high draft pick, couple of big moves, and here we go. Markstrom's debut with the Canucks as well. Bouchard's debut with the Canucks. Neighbors, Leonov, and the rest of the crew. Hunter Jones getting the start at Honda Center in Anaheim to kick off year number seven with the Canucks. Let's see what kind of a year it will be. Let's try and set the tone right away. First period, 0-0 after 20. Shot 17-8 to for the Canucks through 20 minutes. Second period now, 1-0, and it's Markstrom opening it up. His first goal as a Canuck in his first game with Vancouver and he opens up the scoring 1-0 Vancouver after 40. How fitting. Shots 33-19 after 40. Third period now. Let's try to extend the lead here on the road before we head back home to host the Kraken, I believe, for game number two of the season. Power play Anaheim halfway through the period. It's an extended opportunity for the Ducks. We kill it off. Very well done. They've come back in the shots, but we're still up with five minutes to go. 40 to 31 in the final two minutes. Final minute. Oh my goodness, what a start. Hunter Jones with a 32 save shutout. And Stefan Markstrom with the game winning goal. Shots ended what? 40 to 32. Hunter Jones, second star with a, those 32 saves. Markstrom, third star. Bannister did very well. 39 saves, but not enough as Markstrom broke through. Who got the assist on that one? Heronic and Tippett. Wow. All right. I see you, Stefan. I see you. Great start for his tenure here in Vancouver. That seven year deal starting off. Very well done. Let's sim the home opener here in Vancouver and then we'll get to some calendar simulation. Let's try and keep it rolling. I would love to see more scoring though. Well done to Hunter Jones to start off with the shutout. His sec the start of his second full season with us. Let's see what we can do here at home hosting uh, Brock Besser and the Kraken. First period, 2-2 after 20. LeCaire Mackey on the power play, then Shane Wright on the power play. Owen Tippett gives us the lead, then Brock Besser ties it up late. Shots 12-11 for the Kraken, 2-2 after 20. Second period, 4-2. Shane Wright on the power play and Brock Besser on the power play. So we've allowed three power play goals in 40 minutes. Two goals to Wright, two goals to Besser, and we're down 4-2. Shots are 26-20. And we have a chance here in the final 20 minutes, though. It's not done yet. As we have LeCaramaki and who scored the first one? LeCaramaki and Tippett. Let's see some more top six scoring. Let's see some defensive. Okay, Josh Norris with a shorthanded goal. He knows that he's on thin ice. Now a power play for us. Killed off by the Kraken. Our pony killers really fell apart in this one. Final three minutes to go. Down by one with a lot of shots going for us, but not enough late. Josh Norris' shorthanded goal was great. Shots end 36-34 for Seattle, and we drop it 4-3 because of a disgusting effort for the penalty killing, I suppose. Markstrom, two assists, though. Three points in two games. It was a tight loss. It was a tight loss. Let's get to the calendar now for some longer-term simulation. No date in particular. I just want to get some simulation done. It's been a long enough of a... Not really an intro, but it was a long enough start to the episode. Let's get through it now. On the road, 3-2 win against the Bruins. 4-3 win against the Flyers. 5-3 win. 5-1 win. 5-4 overtime win. 4-3 shootout win. Keep it rolling. We're winning beyond regulation a lot there. 6-4 win. Hoo-hoo-hoo. Head coach replacing the AHL. Keep it rolling. Keep it rolling. Lauschpa. <laughs> Lauschpa. Here we go. Keep it going. 4-1 win. 4-3 win. 6-1 loss. Woo. Okay. Okay, take a pause. Wow, what a start to the season. We go, we win, then we lose. One and one in the first two games. Well, let's get just cooked back in the lineup here for a second. All right, and then after that, we'll go, hey, of course it keeps simming. That's crazy. So we are one and one. We go on a nine game winning streak. Then lose two in a row, six one and six nothing. Outscored twelve to one, but we're ten three and oh. I want to pause for a second to, to recognize that. Whew, let's go see a game now at this point. We're simulating great. Let's go see the Maple Leafs. Why not? A little all Canadian matchup on the road against the Senators. Two one loss, a five four overtime loss. Two of course, of course. After going, after having a nine game winning streak in the next five games, after that we go o three and two. 
in the five games after the nine game winning streak. <laughs> all right, here we go against the Maple Leafs that are, who are nine, six, and oh. Let's get a little bit of an all Canadian matchup going. First period, 0-0. Zero, zero. Second period, one nothing. It's Owen Tippett on Carter Hart. Wouldn't be in the league at this point in this real in the real world, but in this reality, he's still out there. one nothing. Owen Tippett giving us the lead, and that's Jonathan LeCaramacki extending our lead to two. Thank you very much. I'm very excited to see their numbers. Halfway through the third period, we're up to nothing. Don't you dare tell me. Lundqvist makes it three nothing. I totally forgot about him making his debut when I spoke about the uh, people making their shark, their Canucks debut in game number one. Final eight seconds. And Hunter and Jones gets another slow sim shutout. Shots end thirty four to thirty one. I think it was Hunter Jones. Yes, thirty four safe shutout for Hunter Jones. Frederick Lundqvist a goal and an assist. The rookie continues. Hopefully he's on a good pace. We'll take a pause in a moment to see how he's doing. And Owen Tippett with a goal as well for third star honors. 3-0 Canucks victory to break that little 0-3-2 streak we had going and buy a shutout to boot. Why not? So that's 17 games. 18, 19, 20. Let's pause after 20 games and then we'll check how things are looking for a quick little overview. Columbus, Tampa, then Winnipeg. 5-3 win, 6-2 win, 2-1 shootout win. Absolutely love it. Shots are... Uh, shots. The record is 14-4-2. 23 points in 20 games from Stefan Markstrom. That is why we brought him into this team. Markstrom looking great. LaCaramacchi with 17 points. Lundqvist, the rookie, 16 points and a plus 11. Pedersen, 15. Hronik, 15. Woo -hoo -hoo for what? Hronik. Tippett, 14. Hughes, 12. Norris, 11. Okay, he woke up. Hannafin, 10. O'Brien, okay, 9. Point every, uh, like a 40-point pace right now. Bouchard, Neighbors, Ratu. Oh, Ratu for that ice time. That's the biggest shock here. Seven points playing over 20 minutes a night. Tom Goldman, five points. Okay, Bouillon with three. He's getting power play time as well. No, he's not anymore, eh? Now that we brought Marshman in. Might want to put him on the power play. Put Coles in, limited ice time. Oh, actually, he plays 11-19. Good. Klimovich, peak with one assist plus two. Okay. And goaltending Jones is 10-2-2 two two with two shutouts. 9.23 save percentage, 2.66 goals against. Leonov, 4-2-0. 9.03 save percentage, but 2.64 goals against. Okay. Wow, this team is firing on all cylinders right now. Uh, often has one goal as a sniper. That's great. Miknov looks really good, a defenseman. Nurse is just looking in the AHL quickly. Mohamed Shen as well. Okay, very good. Where's uh, Niskala? Ooh, seven points. Negative 11 from Miko Niskala? That's something to be concerned about, I gotta say, down in the AHL. Yeesh. Ah, yikes. Okay, well, that being said, let's get back to the calendar simulation. Definitely don't want to stop while we're as hot as we are now. So let's just keep it rolling. Any game we want to go see, maybe, let's go see the Oilers. Another all-Canadian matchup, but it'll be the Bouchard uh, matchup as well. 6-2 loss, then a 4-0 win. I wonder if that's another shutout for Hunter Jones. In Edmonton, the Oilers are 13-6-2. We're 15-5-2. Evan Bouchard against his old team. He spent his entire career in Edmonton, over 600 games. And now he has a chance here against the Oilers. First period for the first time, 1-0. It's Ryan Pollock scoring on Leonov, who's in nets for this one. Second period, 2-2. Nugent Hopkins makes it 2-0, but then put Colson and Markstrom on Logan Thompson, tying it up. Uh, does that put Colson's first goal of the season? Shots 27-25, Edmonton after 40, but we're all tied at 2 into the final frame here. Power play Oilers early, and it's Tyler Bertuzzi, former Canuck, getting the goal on the power play. Edmonton power play again, this time killed off. We're still only down by one, and put Colson with his second of the season and second of the night, but then Bertuzzi right back. His second of the period re-extends and restores the Edmonton lead. Oh, and power play Vancouver now, killed off by the Oilers. Final three minutes, we're getting a ton of shots on net. Final minute, 14 seconds. Ah, oh, and then Brady Abrisson adds an empty netter. Shots end 43 to 38, but the Oilers win 5 to 3. Put Colson with two goals. Uh, yeah, tough loss, tough loss, but we did well. Just a tough little end there. And the special teams as well. We got to take a pause, look at the special teams soon enough as well. I want to make sure it's a, a large enough sample size before we do that, but soon enough. So, no game in particular. Let's just sim and see what happens. A couple of weeks here. Let's go see Seattle, 3-1 win, 5-2 win against the Flames, uh, against Vegas, 5-4 overtime loss, tough, that was a tight one. Penguins, we beat them 4-2, we beat the Lightning 3-2, okay, okay. Let's keep on going, no need to stop when we're simulating, when we're firing all cylinders. Actually, gotta update the scouting, I'm a, few, I'm a couple weeks late, but that's okay. 4-2 win, 3-2 win, that's a four-game winning streak now, I'll just quickly pause to update the scouting. Okay, back to the calendar now. Let's go see the Montreal Canadiens. That'll be a big one. Markstrom back at the Bell Center for the first time. That will be a big one. We'll sim through a couple of games until there. We should be, yeah, so 7-2 loss, 5-2 win, 4-2 win, 
five four shootout loss. And a four three overtime loss to the Ducks. A lot of our games have gone beyond regulation. So a lot of big ones coming up now. The Predators are a good team, twenty two ten and two. The Sabers are a good team, twenty three ten and one. The Canadians are just above five hundred, but of course, larger implications for why we want to go see them. So let's sim the next week here. Kings six four win, tight seven six loss, five one win, then a six three win. All right, we can do that. So tough, tough seven six loss here against uh, the Predators. But we are twenty six eight and five now facing the sixteen seventeen three Montreal Canadiens. Even with Celebrini, with Haggins, with Suzuki, with uh, Doc, with uh, Slavkovsky, with all those names there, they're below five hundred, and I'm sure that they're missing Markstrom right now. So going to the Bell Center, Markstrom getting a big uh, thank you on the jumbotron. I'm not sure how much of a thank you from the fans. I'm sure there was disgruntlement on both sides. Was it more the fans with management? I don't know. But here at Assemblée. Let's do it. First period, 2-1 Canucks. Owen Beck opens it up. Then Goldman answers back about five minutes later. And Atu Ratu gives us the lead 2-1. Despite shots being 15-9 for the Canadians, we lead by one heading into the second period. Second period, 4-2. Elias Pedersen makes it 3-1. Owen Beck scores his second Bizu Bizu Starfleet legend in our San Francisco series on Thursday nights, our expansion franchise mode. That made it a 3-2 game. Then Pedersen, his second of the period, restores the two-goal lead. We're still being outshot 24-22, but we're up by two here in the third period now nothing uh, i'm sure marshall has something with those top six goals but no goals from him in the first 50 minutes so far. We want to really make a statement here in front of his old team. Management watching. Power play Vancouver. It's Quinn Hughes. The captain scores on the power play. We're still being outshot, but we're going to win this one by a score of, it looks like, 5-2 to two the final. Shots end 34-28. to 28. So the goaltending really did us well this time as it's Hunter Jones getting third star honors. Elias Pettersson, two goals and two assists. Anything from Marstrom? Yes, one assist in 21-42 of ice time. Markstrom, look at that, in front of the old home fans. 44% on the dot. Yeah, I wonder where his face-off percentage is. But I think his face-off attribute is uh, quite high. That brings us to game 40. So one more game now against the Penguins. This will be the official halfway point for a game number 41. This will be it before we take our pause now, ladies and gentlemen. Our record is incredible. Let's see if we can get one more to make it a 56-win pace. Uh, Giovanni Smith scores on the first shot, and Kvapil scores on the second shot. Two goals on two shots on Lianov. Fantastic. First period ends 2-1 as Quinn Hughes scores on the power play. Philip Gustafson, legend. Data 72 Hall of Fame nominee. Second period, 2-2. We're all tied up. It's Markstrom tying it at two. Shots are 25-21 in our favor. After allowing two goals in the first two shots, we come back with two goals in two periods and we're all tied up heading into the third period now 2-2 game we're leading the shots but it's Jake Gensel uh, restoring the Penguins lead 3-2 Penguins with 10 minutes to go now shots are in our favor 36-30 in the final five minutes or so now do we have a final late push the Penguins a sub 500 team come on let's push late final minute but the Penguins hang on tight shots and 40 to 35 Philip Gus the bus Gus of sit my goodness all right, so ladies and gentlemen, at 27, 9, and 5, our pace right now is to go 54, 18, and 10, which would be by far our best record with the Canucks so far. Let's take a moment now and see how everything looks in the standings. In the entire NHL, we are leading the league. The Avalanche have four games in hand, and they're four points back, so maybe you could call them the true leaders at 74.3 for the point percentage. But we lead the NHL right now with a record of 27, 9, and 5. We're looking great. We sit atop the league. Our goals for per game at 3.61 is not the very top, but I believe that's, what, sixth best? And our goals against at 2.93 is second best. Very good to see Power play at 26.8%, which is third best in the NHL. And a penalty kill, I don't think this is great, of 82.1. All right, which is actually not as far down as you'd think. That's 8, 9, 10, 11. Time for 11th is that? Around. So better, closer to the top than the bottom, but could definitely be better than 82.1% in my mind. Looking at the point totals now, who else? Who else? It's Stefan Markstrom leading the way with 46 points in 41 games, on pace to score 92 points. My goodness, look at him. We're lucky. I'm jinxing it now for next episode. No injuries yet. That's been great. I know it takes away a bit from the realism, but injuries are on. But you know, we're getting lucky for now, we'll say. Elias Pettersson on pace for 90 points. Frederick Lundqvist, look at this guy, on pace for 46 goals in his rookie season, and on pace for 78 points, same for Jonathan LeCaramacchi, on pace for 40 goals and 78 points, this is the top six we've been waiting for, and even Owen Tippett on pace for 68 points, yes, yes, 
my goodness. Now the second line plus minus, sorry, the first line plus minus is not great. That second line seems to really be carrying. Philip Hronik on pace for quietly, on pace for what, 58 points? Wow, Philip Hronik leading defensive scoring on a career high pace as well. Wow, 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 wow. Meanwhile, Quinn Hughes, eee, kind of what we've been seeing from Quinn Hughes. Is this just who he is now? That's a bit, con that's quite concerning, actually. That he's on pace for 56 points does not sit super well with me. Ratu on pace for 52. This is who he is at this point. That's fine. Still, we expect a bit more from like almost 22 minutes per night, but okay. Josh Norris playing only about 13 minutes per night on pace for 48 points. Okay. Evan Bouchard on pace for 40. We'd want a bit more from him. Caden O'Brien on pace for what? That's 34 points. I want a bit more from Caden, a bit more. But Cole's in 14, Goldman 13, again, limited ice time, but he's doing okay. Hannafin 13 points plus 16, playing with Heronic. Neighbors 11, Klimovich with 7, Bouillon with 4. I want to get him on the power play if I can. Peak with 3 points, there you have it. Golden now, Hunter Jones is 21-3-5 with 3 shutouts, a 9-20 save percentage, and 2.67 goals against average. Leonov, on the other hand, 6-6. Eh, six and six with an 885 save percentage and 3.41 goals against average. Yikes. Looking in the entire NHL, Miko Rantanen, 60 points, leads the league, but we're not that far off with uh, with 40 whatever, 40 what, 46? Yeah, 46 is not that far off. Markstrom and Pedersen both have the same amount as some of those stars, like what, who, like Jack Hughes I saw there. Defensive scoring, it's Kale McCarr leading the way, but Hironik is not that far back. He, I'm not saying he's going to lead, that's for sure, but I'm saying he's in that like top 10 conversation. Hironik is looking very impressive. For the rookie skaters, Lungfist, yeah, he's leading, of course. The first overall selection, Nico Salmalainen, that's another element to the uh, rivalry with Seattle. 20 points for him, and Ned Buss, the second overall pick. Interesting, so second overall pick, first overall pick, Third overall pick, Lungfist leading the way. And for the goaltenders in the league, it's Devin Levi with 21 wins right now. But if we want to see, let's see, minimum 30 games played. That's all the starters seem to have. Best save percentage, yeah, by a good, by a fair margin to Hunter Jones. Great numbers so far, ladies and gentlemen. Great numbers to see. And then again, taking a look in the AHL, as I wanted to do, Offman, 27 points in 30 games. All right, they picked it up a little bit. That's good. Perot, Niskala as well, finally. The plus minus, still not great. But even Miknov, Shen, negative 11. It's, it's all about the ice time, right? Cody Brown, 13 points in 30 games from Cody Brown. I want to see more from him. And the goaltending, yeah. Okay, Muller has a medium league potential, but not looking too hot. Oscar Janssen, if he wants to be an, H, an NHL backup or in the NHL conversation, he's got to see some growth. It's a couple of years now that he's stuck at a 75. So I won't advance to the next game. I'll go ahead and stop it there. This is where we are at the halfway point of year number seven. We are looking incredible. Again, I don't think the retooling is over yet. We still have more growth, but the pieces are in place. Now let's consider the trade blocks heading into the next episode as well. Keep in mind the trade value of our players we have here. Just quickly scrolling down. Seeing all the players we have here. There you go. If you're interested, some other guys in our system. Dominguez. Oh, don't forget these guys. Quint. Don't forget them. For our draft picks, we have one first, no second, two thirds, two fourths, two fifths, two sixths, no seventh. In 2031, we have all our picks except for a first and a seventh. Keep that in mind when we're considering possible trades. We'll look at the AHL stats for closing it out as well. So players on the block, sorting by overall. If anyone catches your eye, let me know. If you want to know more about a player, like this guy Bjorkstrand, 73 overall, 19 years old, looks very interesting. Robert Bjorkstrand, just throwing it out there. But if you want to know more about a prospect, let me know in the Discord server or on YouTube. I can get you some more information. Arizona, Raquel and Fitzgerald. Boston, prospects here. Buffalo, prospects. Calgary, nobody. Carolina, I wonder, did Calgary get that defenseman signed on in the end? Lindholm? Yeah, he signed a one-year deal at 2.47, so they had enough money for that. Gotcha. Uh, Calgary, so Carolina. More prospects that we were looking at earlier from the Hurricanes. Blackhawks have Hartman plus some other pieces, like this prospect here. Abelshauser, quite a name. Colorado prospects. Columbus prospects, including Pakarinen, Pakarinen, Pakarinen. Uh, Dallas, Pinelli, Wenberg, and etc. Detroit, Moritz Seider still on the block here for the Red Wings. He's still here. Let's see, 19 points in 40 games on a decent pace, actually. He's been like a 30-point guy. He's on a better pace. Negative 7, but again, he eats yeah, big, big minutes, 25-plus minutes 
on a Detroit team that is, yeah, they're not horrible, but they're around 500. So Cider, Yamamoto, Glass, Jack High on the block in Detroit. Edmonton, big names here in Edmonton as well. Pollock, Chikrin, Nurse, White Cloud, Ghost, Brisson, Stillman, and Miromanov. The Oilers, though, are a winning team, so I wouldn't think they want to do too, too much. Florida, Verhage still on the block. He's still out here. What's he up to? He's having a good season as well. 34 points in 39 games. All right, Carter, I see you. And the Panthers are, again, though, a winning team. So things would have to change by the deadline. Los Angeles prospect, Minnesota prospect, Montreal prospect, Nashville, and Philip Forsberg. Hang on, Montreal, do they have cap space now? No, still the same situation. So Markstrom would have been left for the whole season as an unsigned RFA. So Nashville, yeah, Philip Forsberg on the block, expiring deal, but Nashville, again, they're a good team. Philip Forsberg, 26 points in 38 games, expiring contract, Barabanov, Hayek. Do we have an un... I have... Uh, here we go. He would fit the first line. I kept one scout this year. I don't usually do this, but we have enough scouts where we need to have them. I do have one professional scout this season, and that's good to see as Kapusta's fit would be first line for Forsberg, just to know in theory, right? Nashville, excuse me, New Jersey, we see Justin Barron. Islanders, Pelik, Romanov, Bolzuk, and then a few other pieces at the bottom there. Um, three years left on Pelik and Romanov. Rangers, a few miscellaneous pieces. Ottawa, Sprong, Manjapane. There's Mar uh, Marchand. Two-year deal, but likely retires after the season. The Sens are 18, 16, and 6. Marchand, what's he up to as an 81 overall, 41 years old? Uh, let's see, 24 points in 40 games. Definitely not the simulation that he's had in the past, but still something like a 50-point pace. Yeah, so yeah, something around that area. Playing fourth line and second power play. With Kapuza, he would fit first line and second power play for us. Okay, good to know. That's helpful to have a pro scout sometimes. Even though it's all about X-Factors, I, I digress. Sanheim, York, Tarasenko, Newhook, Cates, a lot of names here in Philadelphia. Pittsburgh, mostly miscellaneous pieces. San Jose, some prospects. Seattle, Dunn, and Edmondson. Vince Dunn would fit. Yeah, I won't know for sure, but yeah, 16 points from Dunn so far in the year, negative plus minus. Roy, Kapanen, and Burakovsky in St. Louis. Tampa Bay, miscellaneous pieces and prospects. Same for Toronto. Still the same prospects that we had seen earlier. Vegas, Braden Tracy. Washington, Fabro, Sandine, and DeMello. Sandine, expiring contract. I like the Sandine a lot. Rasmus Sandine would fit the third deep pairing, though. Mm -hmm. Winnipeg, Trenton, Walsh, CC. All right, they're the trade blocks, ladies and gentlemen, if anything piques your interest. But again, it's hard to say too much about a team that's on pace for 54 wins. And to keep in consideration for any extensions, Norris, O'Brien, Petkolzin, those are the main guys. Norris wants six by six. Obviously, we bring it down, but that's still pretty costly. We could still keep him this season just to be the third line center and let him walk next year, or we get value for him now. I don't know. Things are going super well, when you, as you can see by our record. Uh, Caden O'Brien, he'd be at UFA time, so he wants to get paid about $3 million for his contract. And put Coles in, looking around $2 million on his contract. Aside from that, everyone else, miscellaneous numbers. But just keep in mind, <laughs> before we close out, you got to see this. Usually when a new player joins the team who's a generated prospect, I'll go and look at the player just to see if there's anything interesting about them. Usually there's nothing to see. But for Stefan Markstrom, you got to see this. Stefan Markstrom has, wait for it, wait for it, the gray afro. Maybe you can call it the silver afro. Look at this facial hair. Look at this man. Look at this man, Stefan Markstrom, the first overall pick of 2025. Here he is in Vancouver with the gray afro, the gray uh, the, uh, the goatee, the mustache. One of the best generated prospects I've ever seen, hands down. Just all the makings of a future Hall of Famer. Look at the tape on the on the on his socks as well. <laughs> This is crazy. I absolutely love it. I hope you do too. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. The first half of year number seven. Long enough episode, so I'll save the, the long-winded outro. Leave all your thoughts down here in the YouTube comments or over on the Discord server. Link in the description. We'd love to have you there. Make sure to leave a like if you enjoyed and subscribe if you haven't already. We have just surpassed 7,500 subscribers. So thank you everyone for the support here on the channel. If you're watching and you're not subscribed, we'd love to have you. It's free. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't give me anything aside from giving you the opportunity to be notified when our uploads happen. You won't miss anything here 
here in our various series. Our MLB The Show 24 series starting soon. League simulations, career simulations on that. All of our NHL 24 content, franchise mode, simulations, our live stream on Thursday evenings as well. There's a lot that you won't want to miss, and we'd love to have you be a part of the team. It's, it was an exciting first half. Markstrom here in Vancouver, he's making his mark. I'm looking forward to the second half. Do we need to make any changes to anything? Moving out, bringing in? That's for you, the assistant general managers, to decide. So I'm very much looking forward to reading your thoughts and seeing you once again in the next one.